I want to start by introducing myself. My name is Brad Gordon. Uh, I serve as uh, co-chair of the Three County COC, uh, and uh, I am also the executive director of the Berkshire County Regional Housing Authority. And I want to admit uh, from the get-go that I'm actually a little bit nervous, and I'm nervous because uh, this is important, and I want to make sure that I adequately convey uh, the incredible work that the Three County COC uh, does each and every day. Uh, and what I'm going to start with uh, before I get into the, well, actually, what I'm going to start with is an announcement first. <laughs> uh, so uh, and let me start with this announcement. GCTV will be providing a live stream of the Three County Continuum of Care annual meeting on GCTV's Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch channels. The video will also be made available for later viewing by GCTV on public access channels around Western Massachusetts. So. So what I want to do is I want to um, people to focus on uh, the, the PowerPoint slide and the picture of the house in that slide. Can everybody see that? Great. So I just want to spend uh, a couple minutes. I know I have a brief period of time uh, talking about that house, actually. Uh, and hoping that it gives us context for today's meeting a little bit. So that house was built in 1954. In 1954, it sold for $13,000, which is the equivalent of about uh, $126,000 uh, in today's economy. The house is approximately 1,200 square feet. It's got three bedrooms, one bathroom, no basement, no garage, and it sits on about a quarter acre lot. Uh, it's located in a post-World War II subdivision in the city of Pittsfield. So just based on those facts, it's not hard to argue by most objective standards that it's a modest and unremarkable house. Yet for the family that has lived in that house for over 30 years, it has literally and figuratively been foundational to the stability, well-being, and success of that family. And just to be more specific about that, it's provided them with a safe place and neighborhood to come home to every day. It's provided them shelter from the elements. It's a place to cook healthy meals. It's a place where the children that lived in that household could do their homework or work on their educational attainment or achievement and develop other skills uh, that would help them later in life. It's a place where family and friends could connect. It's a place where people that live there could recover from illness or stress or loss or extend that shelter to fa other family members. It's a place where the folks in that household could uh, work on their job advancement. And finally, it's a place uh, where the people in that household could accumulate some equity and some level of wealth and greater financial stability and independence. So today we're gonna spend a fair amount of time talking about some really important programs featuring a number of really powerful data points. But what I hope out of all this is that we don't lose sight of what we're trying to do here. And what we're trying to do here is give people the same opportunity that we all either have or desire to have or desire to have with the people that we love. And the house in that uh, photo is my house. That's where I live. So I, all I want is the same thing uh, that I have for everyone else. I genuinely want that. And so again, it's gonna be, you can get, it, it can be dizzying talking about all the data and all the different things that we're involved in. But at the end of the day, that, that, that's what this is about. And I wanted to say one other thing about this house because it relates to the keynote address that we're gonna uh, talk about later today. Um, that house uh, was built in 1954, and it's not lost on me that in 1954, the Supreme Court rendered the uh, Brown v. the uh, Board of Education decision. Uh, Brown v. Uh, Board of Education uh, basically said the existing law of the land, which uh, was Plessy v. Ferguson, and Plessy v. Ferguson said that uh, separate but equal. And what Brown v. the Board of Education said is separate is inherently unequal. So. I want everyone to view what we're doing today with that lens, because to me, that's very important. And, and I want you to think about whether we have met the promise of Brown v. the Board of Education, fully met that promise. 
So now what I'd like to do uh, is just uh, uh, go through, and I'm gonna, I gotta, <laughs> gonna pull it back up. I switched my view. Uh, go through the agenda. So, so let me just quickly, I'm not gonna go through it in great detail, but about the first half of our meeting is gonna focus on uh, uh, our keynote address, uh, which uh, is gonna be presented by Kamar Taliaferro. And uh, it is gonna be on contextualizing redlining. And I have already had the opportunity to hear parts of this uh, presentation. Uh, we had an in-service with my own organization and it's, it's amazing, it's really, really good. And I think people are gonna get a lot out of this. Uh, then uh, we're gonna spend some time, probably this second half of our meeting, we're gonna focus on uh, looking at the uh, COC's regional efforts and they're considerable. Uh, Kelly and her team have done amazing work as it have the grantees. We're gonna do a year in review, uh, which will highlight uh, coordinated entry system, the emergency housing voucher uh, that have become available in our region, the youth homelessness uh, programming and the advancement of that programming, and some work that's going on uh, with the Western Mass Network and homelessness. I'm gonna to go to the next slide. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about what's next because that's the name of the game here. It's not just to be satisfied with what we have done and we're gonna talk some about that, but what are we going to be doing? Because we still have a lot of work ahead of us. And so uh, we are uh, gonna focus then on uh, uh, some new housing opportunities for the COC. Uh, and uh, one of those is housing uh, for the, or housing specifically for the disabled homeless, a uh, new initiative by the Lewison House uh, and then we're gonna spend some time talking about our racial equity efforts. Uh, and uh, that's also gonna include a look at some of the data that we've uh, compiled uh, in the past year. And uh, then we have some business to conduct. We're gonna have to um, do a membership vote and talk about some updates that were made both to the governance and HMIS uh, charters, which we'll need to vote on. And finally, you'll get to hear from me again. I think you'll hear from me periodically. And hopefully Kelly will remind me of those times that I need to speak. Um, but I'll make some closing remarks also uh, at the end of all of this. Um, so I want to go to back to my agenda. I'm kind of toggling between these. Um, so, all right. So I think at this time, I'm going to be uh, inter formally introducing uh, Kelly Ben Ezra, she serves as the three county COC program director uh, and uh, Michelle LaFleur and Michelle serves uh, as a three county COC data and evaluation manager uh, for community action of uh, Pioneer Valley. And uh, it's my understanding that we're gonna just spend a little time uh, before uh, the uh, keynote address on uh, really looking at uh, our members membership demographics and going through that survey uh, as part of our PowerPoint. So I'm gonna turn it over to both Kelly and Michelle at this time. Thanks, Brad. Michelle, you wanna bring it to the, there you go. So just to take a couple quick minutes um, to share that uh, where we're at with our membership. So last year, the board and committees of the COC made a commitment to diversify our membership. And this was in order to more fully represent the population that we serve and to increase the number and the voices that are sitting at our tables and making decisions. Uh, our membership supported a written commitment to this in our charter last year. And so this year we created a demographic survey and we had 34 respondents. So certainly our membership is larger than this group, but uh, what we learned is still informative. We'll continue to evaluate the membership. So if you didn't get a chance to take the survey, I'm gonna put a link in the chats where you can visit our website's event page and that's where it is. And Michelle is going to share a little bit about what it's told us so far. Michelle. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so yeah, as Kelly mentioned, um, we wanted to share some of the responses from the survey. Um, and there were 34 responses. I'm just going to go through some of them um, quickly and kind of compare them to what we're seeing in the demographics of those who are experiencing homelessness. So we saw 75% of people who responded were female, uh, which is compared to 35% of those who are experiencing homelessness are female. 12% um, of respondents identify as non-binary or genderqueer. 
um, compared with 0.4% of those enrolled in a shelter or transitional housing program over the past year. 6% of respondents identified as transgender, compared to about 1% of the population experiencing homelessness. Um, 25 to 55 year olds make up about two thirds of the membership based on the survey results, um, compared to 56% of the population experiencing homelessness. Um, we don't really have data uh, for everyone um, experiencing homelessness on LGBTQ status, but we do know that approximately one third of those who responded to the survey identified as LGBTQ plus. Um, 12% of respondents identified as um, Black, Indigenous, or person of color. 17.6% um, 17, 17 identified as Hispanic or Latino or Latina, and this is compared to 14.9% of those experiencing homelessness. 6% um, of respondents identified as Black or African American, compared to 13.4% of those experiencing homelessness. Um, so this is there's a gap between who is in the membership that we saw and who is experiencing homelessness. Um, 6% of respondents also identified as uh, American Indian, Native American, or Indigenous. Um, and across the survey responses, it was clear that um, in this field, we have a wide variety of life experiences which inform everyone's work, um, including um, substance abuse, um, experiences with homelessness, 38% of respondents identified experience with homelessness, and 25% of respondents identified as having a disabling condition. Um, okay, now I'm going to um, stop these slides. Show Thank you everyone. So I am going to now introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, our keynote speaker is uh, Kamar Taliaferro. Uh, I just learned this and I have known Kamar for about 15 years. I, I've learned that he's an amateur uh, genealogist, which I didn't know. Uh, he is a community activist and I, I am just gonna have to editorialize this a little bit. I, I'm, I always wonder what that means. And it, if it means uh, someone that uses their considerable intelligence, energy and thoughtfulness uh, to make their community better uh, and more just then that really definitely uh, describes Kamar. So I just want to put that out there. Um, and uh, Kamar has been a lifelong resident of Pittsfield. He was born and raised in subsidized housing and he graduated from Pittsfield High School in 2011. And I'll also editorialize by saying he had an amazing uh, middle distance and distance coach when he ran track there. I'm not gonna name names. Uh, he was awarded the Christian A. Her Memorial Scholarship and attended Williams College on and off from 2011 to 2014. He has worked with Dr. Francis uh, Jones Sneed as a researcher on a case study of the West Side neighborhood in uh, Pittsfield, examining the historical record for the presence and investigating the ongoing effects of redlining, which we're going to talk about today, in one of the New England's mill towns. He currently chairs the Standing Committee on Housing for the Berkshire County Chapter of the NAACP, and he was recently appointed at the inaugural board of the Pittsfield affordable housing trust fund uh, and he uh, <laughs> and he uh, uh, also uh, is uh, at least categorizes himself as a beginning farmer who operates uh, a uh, fourth of an acre farm within walking distance of the colonial theater and for those of you that don't know Pittsfield uh, that's in the uh, downtown section of Pittsfield and that also begs the question why I haven't uh, benefited from any of this bounty yet, because I'm not too far from that. But that, we'll talk about that some other time. So um, I, uh, and most importantly, out of all those things, Kamara is my friend. Uh, so I'm really proud and happy to have him here today. And I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say, Kamara. Brad, thank you for such a warm introduction. And, um, Quickly, uh, can I just get confirmation that everyone can see my screen and you are seeing the slides and not the text box that I'm going to be presenting from today. All right, cool. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me today. Uh, this work was really a team effort and a culmination of many hands making work light. And those awesome people who helped are Sue Denault, Tessa Kelly, Nicholas Russo, Emmanuel Copeland, Rebecca Park, the entire staff of the local history department in the Berkshire Athenaeum, and of course, Dr. Francis Jones Sneed. What I'm gonna be pre presenting today um, is an excerpt from a report that was commissioned by Greylock Federal Credit Union and Berkshire Bank 
Um, and, you know, it's entitled Redlining in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, a case study. And I want to start by leveling with everyone here about two things. First, we're getting ready to go through like uh, 12 decades of history. So there's a lot of depth um, that we're going to be sailing straight over today. I suspect there's going to be a lot of lingering questions regarding the conclusion of the report and tussling out some of the ripple effects that we see today. And the conclusion from our report is our research showed a connection through time between space, race, home ownership status, and access to political power. These connected factors acted as a means of reinforcing lower caste status on Black Pittsfield residents <clears throat> and were reinforced by employment discrimination and urban renewal. These dynamics are still with us today, defining both the challenges we face and the solutions that we can imagine to those challenges. The second thing that I wanna come clean about at the outset, the working conclusion I've drawn from the process of this research is that the most direct approach to remedying this history is unlikely to be available to us in the short term. That being municipalities becoming developers to enter the mixed income multi-use development chasm unavailable due to the way housing production is funded and to election cycles. So as we move through this report today, I think there's a few questions that are gonna be helpful in guiding us and reflecting on the implications of the conclusion. How would we dilute concentrated poverty? What to do about wage and wealth inequality? How to soften the blows from the constellation of disparate impacts from this history? What land use policies on the municipal scale will engender more equitable development? How do we build relationships based in reciprocity and trust between historically marginalized communities and the institutions responsible for their marginalization? What does allyship act like? Now, you don't have to remember those questions. We're gonna be seeing them again, so don't worry. So what is redlining? I think we need a quick definition. It's the practice of denying and limiting financial services, mainly home loans to particular neighborhoods, often due to race and ethnicity. And most striking are the residential security maps created by the Homeowners Loan Corporation between 1935 and 1940, whose color-coded risk grades inspired the term redlining. Working with this definition, we have to understand two additional dynamics. Segregation and discriminatory access to capital predate these residential security maps and subsequent federal land use policy implemented locally, built on the ramifications of these security maps, impacting where, how much, and what kind of housing would get built in the proceeding decades. Contextualizing redlining in this way can help us understand concentrated areas of poverty, as well as the ideologies created by those concentrated er areas of poverty that seem to limit housing production today. So I'm going to be focusing most on one section of the West Side that was redlined, the historic Deering Mill and Satinette Street neighborhood, the DMS neighborhood, which today is an ex extremely low income and low income project. <laughs> we'll see how between 1900 and 1960, the black population in Pittsfield became concentrated in the West Side Ward 6, and particularly the DMS neighborhood for black families who rented as more black families moved to Pittsfield. And then we'll survey the land use policies that followed this period of segregation and housing discrimination, um, briefly examining the structures of the relationship between tenure status, location, race, and the politics of land use policy. So at the beginning of the 20th century, the black population in Pittsfield was relatively small. By 1960, it was still relatively small, um, but it had more than doubled to um, 859 people. This growth was driven by migration. In fact, among those black families who had been in Pittsfield prior to the great migration, their tradition was to get some education, get out and not return. This was because there was a lack of opportunity for them. It's a dynamic that still exists today. So the maps we're gonna be looking at over the next few slides were compiled using census data and land records from 1900 through 1940. They show where black families resided and whether they owned or rented. Uh, red is for renter, the red circles are for renters. Yellow is for homeowners. The size of the circle denoting the size of the household. Now there's a handful of ye yellow circles with um, white and red around the outside of them. And these denote household, white households who have black borders or domestic servants. 
So the map for 1900, we can see that there's a there's a corridor where many black families lived. Um, it's on the left hand side of our screen. And that is what we call the West Side today. The 1910 map shows that black renters in particular were now more dispersed throughout the city. The 1920 map, we see black families have shifted back to the same quarter from the 1900s map. And this map, this 1930s map shows us something new. We see the same corridor that we see in 1900 and 1920, now significantly more heavily concentrated. But there's a dense cluster of black renters near the railroad tracks. That's that roughly triangular shape um, near what is supposed to be the railroad tracks on this map. Now this 1930 census is the first which captures the settling of Jim Crow refugees in Pittsfield that captures the great migration. And it's a proxy for where black families lived during 1936 when the residential security map was created. <clears throat> uh, the Hulk map, um, in fact, that Hulk map, um, when we compare it to this map, we see a majority of black families would have lived within red lines, including the entire newly formed refugee settlement that was the DMS neighborhood. So I wanna make a quick note about this map. Um, we were working with some historical streets that no longer exist. And the mapping software that we used, um, uh, we had to teach it. So in code, hand coding um, the black families from the census into the map, uh, we missed an entire street, it's Deering Street, uh, which is um, that triangular area that I was just mentioning before. So between 1939 and 1941, the city of Pittsfield endeavored to officially designate this corridor that we've been looking at as blighted and slum riddled. This establishes a connection between black settlement patterns and housing quality in the city. The motivation for the city was to secure state money, <laughs> secure state monies to undertake a proto form of urban renewal. And the city failed in, in this attempt due to its belated action, a pattern that's repeated itself since. Now, as we, combed through the historical record, we didn't see any smoking gun, uh, a quote from a mayor or a neighborhood association or a city sponsored survey that proclaimed that all Negroes must live here. No, racial, settle, uh, racial segregation was the prevailing expectation. It was the widely accepted norm and it would impact the coming decades of housing development. So by the middle of the 1940s, it was widely recognized in Pittsfield as it was throughout the country that there was a housing crisis that was limiting the growth and prosperity of our nation. In this post-war period, the primary strategy used to address this deficit created the suburbs, single family homes, not to be constructed at less than a certain cost on lots above a certain size, connected to employers by new roadway systems for families um, to access new mortgage products that were backed by the Federal Housing Administration. In Pittsfield, where these suburbs were located was correlated with a common understanding of the quality of neighborhoods. It's doubtful that the 1936 security map was known to everyday people, but the West Side, with its busted old housing, filling up with immigrants of every skin tone but the Mayflower sales, was hard to miss. So I know this image we're looking at contains a lot of information. I'm throwing it at us all at once, and I'm not going to walk through it in much detail. But it's from a 1946 housing survey where residents in Pittsfield were asked which cardinal direction in the city they would like to move to or build a new home in. Responses were coded by Ward, and it reflects clearly a desire from those in wards one through four to live to the north and the east in the city. The following decade would deliver on their desires. When this um, survey was compiled, 82% of black families in Pittsfield would have lived in the westerly direction. So we can see that a connection between residential settlement, race, and the residential security maps. Another access of how these maps influence development both within cities and across regions. Um, excuse me, another aspect is how these maps influence development both within cities and across regions. And I think it's that lens in particular that's helpful in understanding how decades of 
public-private divestment policy have created seemingly sacrificial areas of concentrated poverty. Now, one way to comprehend this is to visualize how warehouses were built align with the residential security map. So here we're looking at a map from 1955. It shows new development in the city since 1960. In the 10 years prior to the publication of this map, there was a single family home building boom. Over 2,600 houses were built, including the one that Brad was talking about earlier. Many of them were built where white residents said they wanted them in that 1946 housing survey. And with only one exception, the area north of Anota Lake, every gray shaded area on this map was given at least a B by the homeowners loan corporation assessors. Now, three years prior to this map, this map being published, the city was rezoned in its entirety. The gray shaded areas on, on this map, with the exception of just a few blocks, were all restrictively zoned. Development was limited to single family homes on minimum lot sizes. And those few blocks, which were the exception, contained what are known as economic covenants. And these set a lower boundary in the cost of construction, ensuring only families of certain economic means um, would be able to move there. In Pittsfield, economic covenants in terms of outcomes had the same effects as racial covenants, ensuring homogenous neighborhoods. And this was due to prevalent employment discrimination at the time from the major employer, General, General Electric. Now, another aspect of redlining that I think is important to touch on uh, that shows how this policy of public-private divestment defined where public housing, subsidized housing would be located in the city. And we've seen how petty prevailing prejudice and economic covenants had segregated Pittsfield, concentrating most black families within a small corridor in the city. In 1962, when the Pittsfield Housing Authority began to pursue federal funding for urban renewal, it was estimated that 60% of the black families in Pittsfield lived in a half mile radius of the DMS neighborhood. Now this would make their homes, neighborhoods and communities easy targets for urban renewal. And something that we're not gonna to touch on today, but there was a lack of ownership in the black community. And this left black families in Pittsfield with few means of effective resistance. So as the Pittsfield Housing Authority undertook its urban renewal planning process, the housing quality in the DMS neighborhood in this corridor that we've been focusing on had been suffering from three decades of difficulty accessing mortgages. Homes were nearly a century old. So it was easy to justify a land use policy that would revitalize this section of Pittsfield by developing new commercial districts and the high rise subsidized housing that was in vogue at the time. And it was just as easy to ignore the impacts to the black families that lived here. This map was created just prior to the start of Pittsfield's urban renewal period. It's part of a traffic study that was compiled for the central area business district, our downtown today. I wanna to draw our attention to the dotted line with three black circles. That's to the left of the maroon area in the center of the screen. It was a byway, it was never built, nor were the three interchanges that were planned to accompany it it would have overlaid directly on the corridor we've been talking about. Now, I think it's important to study plans that never came to be, especially for a place like Pittsfield and, otherly, and other similar, similarly situated cities in the Commonwealth, because the impetus of segregation did not lack for imagination. This map is a visual manifestation of the public-private divestment policy that prompted James Baldwin's proverb that urban renewal means Negro removal. This map is also a visual manifestation of the um, hopes and dreams of planners, of um, chambers of commerce, of residents who worked at GE and higher paying jobs had. So as funding from President Kennedy's omnibus housing bill was finally spent by Pittsfield in 1967, and it subsidized the cost of land for the Berkshire Insurance Company, which would eventually build the extremely low income and low income project that exists where the DMS neighborhood once was. So ironically, it was affordable housing that displaced DMS residents, dispersing them throughout the West Side. 
Now, all of these families, regardless of race, that lost their home during this period, the late 60s and early 70s, did so when the city was suffering from an affordable housing crisis. But for Black families, this was presumed to be a good. Um, a, a Berkshire Eagle writer, um, a reporter from our local newspaper, wrote two months after the report that we're looking at um, was finished, quote, Pittsfield social and welfare authorities are quietly rejoicing at a combination of events that will eventually wipe out the last pocket of de facto segregation in Pittsfield, end quote. The neighborhood that had welcomed Jim Crow refugees and served for 40 years as their home, as a basis of community organizing, as uh, the epicenter of a nascent politics would disappear, ushering a transformation of the architectural, social, political, and environmental landscapes of the West Side. Now, what I'm not gonna to touch on today are the forgotten battles that played out between the single family suburbs and subsidized or public housing during the time period of our study, particularly between 1940 and 1975. From planning board secretaries that were allied to taxpayer watchdog groups, in chambers of commerce, appeasing contractor associations to good old fashioned grassroots neighborhood associations, lodging lawsuits against the city and stuffing ballots, all made it clear that the little place public housing had in Pittsfield was in the West Side. These coalitions represented those desirable gray shaded neighborhoods from the 1955 map, and they were overwhelmingly successful. Now this racial dot map is admittedly outdated, but that concentration of green dots just off center is where the Deering Mill and Satinette Street neighborhood once stood 60 years ago. The warning that accompanied the hopeful journalist's report has indeed come to pass, which we're seeing on the screen. Urban renewal and segregated housing and the decades that preceded it had their intended effects. Wards one, two, three, and four were filled with single family housing. Today, wards three and four are least diverse, highest income, highest opportunity scoring neighborhoods. And they consistently see the highest voter, voter turnout in local elections. Meanwhile, between 2000 and 2018, and the census tract describing the West Side, poverty has quadrupled. Housing vacancies have risen into what the Commonwealth defines as hyper vacancy. Educational attainment for West Side children has decreased while disciplinary rates for students of color who attend the middle school that serves most of the West Side have increased. While not linked exclusively to this time period, there's a nearly decade long gap in expected lifespans between the West Side and the area of Pittsfield that realtors market today as the desirable Southeast, wards three and four. Between 1952 and today, there's been a stark contraction of the number and total area of parcels where neighborhood business is allowed by right in the West Side. And this has an impact on where uh, federally designated opportunity zones are today. In this census tract, we live 23.7% of all black identifying people in Pittsfield. That's 15.6% of all black identifying people in the Berkshires living in 0.8 square miles of a county that stretches for an additional 944. The median income for black identifying households in this census tract is $20,489. Citywide, the median income is $57,160. In between 1950 and 2019, the black home ownership rate has decreased by 7.7%. The home ownership rates for whites has increased by 13% in that time frame. Whether intentional or not, the policies of urban renewal and residential segregation that preceded it have had their intended effect. So as we conclude, I'd like for us to reflect on what this history means in the context of the quote on the screen. The quote is from a 1972 housing study commissioned by the Pittsfield Planning Board. I'm not gonna read it, I'll let you guys read it. So re-emerging histories like this one show that the solutions require us to be imaginative and creative, but housing development is expensive and the funding streams are what they are. Now, one of my working conclusions that I had mentioned earlier from this research is that we need to push for significantly more from our municipal housing policies, not state, not federal, but local housing policies. Municipalities can do so much more 
then provide welcoming zoning ecosystem, ecosystems for developers, and then award them incremental tax agreements. Municipalities can do so much more than establish funding streams to await proposals from private and nonprofit developers. These are passive strategies that build on prior and equitable land use decisions. Now, I know that some would argue that those strategies are pragmatic, that public-private partnerships get things done because housing development is expensive and the funding streams are what they are. But my hometown has been dealing with a housing shortage since the 1930s. Over those 80 plus years, the strategies that have been used to build housing have been created by and consistently catered to whoever at the time was lifted up as the avatar of Aryan median income, area median income. Entire systems of land use and housing funding have catered to that avatar's preferences. From mid-century single family suburbs to the too few spatially concentrated and income segregated multifamily projects across the income spectrum to today's focus on downtown amenity adjacent market rate units. These are systems in Pittsfield which empirically created and continue to maintain the slowly creeping violence of concentrated areas of poverty. This is where I wish we had more time to talk about some of those ripple effects. So the most decisive way forward that I see is for municipalities to become developers. I mean, it's, it's evident, Pittsfield's private and nonprofit developers are not building mixed income multi-use developments. They have not for the past 80 years. We need a better strategy than to wait for market conditions to change. Because as we wait, as planners and developers and mayors and town administrators and select boards and city councilors and senators and representatives and executive directors wait for those conditions to change, the median income avatar, my neighbors, I live in Ward 4 today, my neighbors are sensing things not quite working, looking for someone to blame amid all the uncertainty and recreating the zero sum politics that marginalizes effective strategies to house everyone, that prioritizes private, in, private interests in the management of land to the detriment of the broader public good. And it stymies local government's efforts to affirmatively and proactively plan for and implement those strategies that will build places of equitable opportunity with meaningful outcome. Of course, as researchers, uh, we were also asked to develop potential remedies, most of which everyone here would be familiar with. But ultimately our suggestions as researchers are at the whims of decision makers. And I found that most decision makers favor original ideas. Instead of going through that bullet point list, we're gonna have a few minutes to break out, um, a few minutes in breakout groups to settle with this history, to revisit those questions I posed earlier. So choose one or the ones which speak to you in this moment. We'll then regroup and the floor will be open to share and ask questions for a short stretch of time. Thank you. And Kelly, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Kamar. Um, I think it might be good actually to put that right back up on the screen so that people can take notes probably before these um, meet, breakout rooms. But we'll come into the breakout rooms too and give uh, this same group of questions. We'll put them in the chat in the breakout rooms. Um, but obviously, I think you can all probably understand that we want more time with this. This is a group of questions that are deep and contextualized and uh, we certainly aren't looking for there to be an answer today, but um, in talking with Kamar as we were planning for this opportunity, we really recognize that we do need more time for this. And so I think our goal is that in the next couple of months, we will be planning a longer event um, in order for us to really dive in um, to the work that Kamar has done and their team. And so um, what I think would be really helpful is first, think through these uh, questions, really talk to each other about what you think comes to mind um, as you're evaluating them. But really what we want is for you to consider suggestions for these topics, questions that you might want answered while you're um, coming to another event, and then resources that you think exist that might be helpful for us to utilize as we um, deep 
do a deep dive into this. So that's what's going to happen in these breakout rooms. Um, and Chandal is going to move people into them. Um, and we will uh, make sure that we come and visit, make sure everybody knows what they're uh, what they're thinking about and concentrating on, have somebody take notes. And then when we come back together, we'll have a couple of minutes um, for a few people to share what they might have uh, learned or understood in the um, conversations that they've had. Uh, Kamar, did you want to facilitate a brief? Yeah, so um, I think we have maybe about five minutes. Uh, I know we were all in our separate breakout group rooms. Um, and is there, you know, if anyone from each one of those groups would like to just share, um, a, you know, quickly in a, in a minute or so, um, your conversations and what you took from the conversations that you had in the breakout group. Don't be shy, guys. Um, I think we have the raise hand function. Um, so click raise hand and we're just gonna go in the order that they come in. So Dane. Um, our group talked about a few different things about what diluting concentrated poverty looks like in ways that are both pretty evil looking, right? Like let's build real fancy big houses in blighted areas. That's like one version of that. Um, the role that transportation plays, right? The difference between um, slowly changing and building new bus routes, right? With a lot of feedback from people who rely on buses, as opposed to let's build a bullet train to Boston, right? And see what that brings out here. Um, we, there, there was a lot of like, wow, municipal governments building housing is a cool freaking thing. Also, I sit in municipal government and that sounds impossible on top of all the other stuff we do. Um, and the last question we really kind of came to um, that we just started talking about was the idea of building relationships based in trust and reciprocity. We just honestly started naming the institutions that would be required to engage, right? Schools, municipal governments, agencies, uh, hospitals, right? And just, we didn't even get to say out loud what that would begin to look like, so. That is such a crucial point, Dane. And I, I think of public safety discussions that we have in our city and the whole of community response that we need. Um, Philip Ringwood? Sure, yeah. Uh no, I didn't take notes, but, uh, but we, we talked a little bit about the um, uh, the importance of getting involved in current, current zoning review and changes in order to address some of these things. Um, and also we talked a little bit about just addressing transportation resources as a driver of concentrated poverty in rural communities um, and thinking about that interconnectedness um, to address that. Um, uh, the, the, the value of having uh, more, pr uh, supporting more proactive planning departments in municipalities and we were just starting to talk a little bit about kind of also just kind of what does allyship um, look like and how do we uh, how, how do we actually be an ally within the systems that we're working within versus you know, is, are there ways for us to, you know, um, are there ways for us to be doing that differently um, at, kind of uh, outside of the, the systems we're already working inside of. And I, that's, that's my best recap of room seven that I can do. If anybody else, feel free to jump in. Uh, Leon Richards, I saw you had your hand raised earlier. You still want to talk? Yeah, I just wanted to touch base. Like, I couldn't because I'm driving and I'm seeing my phone, so I couldn't actually see the questions. But based upon the information provided, like, personally, I can't identify with the situation in Pittsfield. I have to look at a bigger picture. You know, it's like because the effect it has on the town in each individual state is referenced upon what's going on in the state and the other areas. I only know what's going on in my community where it's the exact reverse of there are actually more, because I live in Athol. There are more people of color buying homes in Athol because they're being pushed from Eastern Mass area because the rent has, there's no rent control and rent has increased. So a lot of that is pushing people West. It is also part of the support that's not there. That's one of the 
the things that open my eyes is cycles of capital and how they flow through cities and who they impact first and who benefits from it. Um, Marianne Bullock. Hi, um, my group focused on um, what land use policies and the municipal scale will increase more equitable development. Um, and we talked a little bit about there being incentives for uh, both developers, landlords, and municipalities to be involved, uh, for there to be um, like equitable development to be at the center, and there being some kind of affordable housing uh, preference policies that introduced in municipal governments. Um, there was conversation about abandoned buildings um, and ha in, in neighborhoods and having municipal governments um, take over those buildings and either convert them into like tiny home villages or, or mixed use housing. And then we also talked about um, what to do about wage and wealth and equity and um, <clears throat> talked about how things like, um, you know, uh, beyond minimum wage, there being living wage, and then also there being reinvestment into communities that have been historically underinvested in um, through things like guaranteed income um, and other types of uh, like deep investments in areas that haven't haven't experienced that. That sounded like an awesome conversation. And uh, as Kelly had mentioned before, we're hoping that we can um, construct more forums, more spaces for us to come together, talk about resources that are available, um, and talk about how maybe people want to do this for their community. Um, so again, thank you everyone today. I look forward to being in conversation with you in the future. Thank you so much, Kamar, and thank you everybody for participating in that. Again, I'm sorry that we don't have enough time to really dive in because um, it's all so important um, and necessary. And I'm so thankful that Kamar was able to be here to talk with us about it today. So I think we're gonna move forward um, and talk a little bit about the three county continuum of care. Um, so I know that sometimes with the annual meeting, we have people who have joined us who are less familiar with the work that we do here. So I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background. Uh, the three county continuum of care provides funding, monitoring and oversight for housing and services. We provide a broad range of training opportunities for area providers in the work of ending homelessness. We run an annual pit count, point in time count, which you might have heard of before, um, and various other opportunities to recognize this region's gaps in services and provide advocacy uh, and needs. And we work to guide a regional vision. We seek out ways to increase and strengthen the resources available to those experiencing homelessness and strive to engage funded agencies and partners in processes and procedures that are anti-racist and bias-free as best we can possibly work towards and that advance the priorities of those that are most impacted by housing insecurity and homelessness. And so you might wanna get involved in our work and we hope that you do. And how you get involved if you aren't already is to either join our board of directors or one of our committees. Most of our committees meet monthly, some of them meet quarterly, and all are an opportunity to lend feedback and voice to the work of the COC and to meet HUD standards um, and best practices in providing funding and monitoring our programs. So the way that you can find out more about that is to join our website, which we will put again in the chat, um, and you can move to the next slide. So another way for you to join the work of the COC and the regional efforts to end homelessness is to participate in training. Um, we have a list here of um, upcoming virtual three county COC trainings and those of our partner agencies. Um, we work very closely with the Western Mass Network to End Homelessness, which I think many of you know of, um, and Pamela Schwartz is here. She's gonna talk in a little while about the work that they are doing. Um, but uh, you can register for one of these trainings. I just wanna share a little bit about um, what we do. You know, This first set of trainings here, identifying and defining chronic homelessness. Um, this is a training series that really helps our coordinated entry assessors and funded agencies to support who we serve in documenting and making referrals 
to um, housing programs that we fund and also housing pro programs that exist around the communities that we uh, work in that that we don't fund, um, but that we partner with um, who are working to house people experiencing homelessness in our region. Um, for those of you who are funded by our, our work, um, you, have, you have a requirement to attend that training, so make sure that you have staff coming. Um, and then I also just wanted to sort of note that the Western Mass Network to End Homelessness has a voter registration info session coming up. Um, we have some very important voting happening this November. Um, so we're encouraging providers to attend and then also uh, encouraging you to share that with people who you are serving, um, who can learn more about the opportunity to, to vote. Um, also, the Massachusetts Housing and Shelter Alliance um, has an upcoming training. They've partnered with um, our COC and two other COCs across Massachusetts to offer this training um, series. Um, and it is going to be uh, presented by Racial Equity Partners, who is um, a friend of ours at the Three County COC, has worked with us for many years now um, on our racial equity efforts here. Um, and then you can see here as well that there are upcoming series happening. Um, if you know of trainings in the work of ending homelessness that you think are important for us to uh, provide to our uh, partners in this work, please reach out and let us know. Um, and Shandal has put um, some information in the um, chat to show you where to go to register for those trainings. Michelle, you can go to the next slide. So at the annual meeting, we really like to give you a little snapshot of what we've been working on and what's to come. And this past year has had many focuses. Next slide. So Community Action Pioneer Valley is what's called the collaborative applicant for the three county continuum of care. And that means that we work to secure and administer all of the region's funding for housing and services. Um, we are also called the HMIS lead, which is the housing management information system. That is where we work um, in data collection and reporting. And that is really necessary and important to make sure that we are providing our uh, state and federal funders with information about the experiences and needs of this population in the three county area. We also um, are the lead agency to run the coordinated entry system, which I'm going to talk about a little bit in a minute. Um, in addition, the staff at uh, Community Action support the membership's effort, efforts um, in addressing the systemic challenges of housing insecurity and homelessness. And that means that we are continually developing initiatives based on federal requirements and also local priorities and needs. So you can just see here a list of the things that we worked on this past year. Um, and uh, if you wanna learn more, reach out and let us know. You can go to the next slide. So our vision at the Three County Continuum of Care includes a housing first model and establishes rehousing strategies that ensure equitable housing for vulnerable populations in our region through what's called coordinated entry. So this system is still a bit of a mystery um, and some partners in the communities we serve need to learn more. So we are working on creating a video to describe it more plainly. We're working with E-Town videos in East Hampton, and we were hoping that video was going to be ready for today, but it's not, um, but it will be released soon. In the meantime, I'll just share that uh, coordinated entry is nationally recognized, and it's meant to ensure fair and equal access to resources. We work to quickly identify people experiencing homelessness and connect them to housing based on their strengths and their needs. In the COC, opportunities for housing and supportive services can be accessed at several locations throughout the community. And we have many assessors who have been trained to do the vulnerability assess assessment to get them into that system. We prioritize, prioritize low barrier programs, client choice, and a multi-centralized access. So some of what we've been doing, you can see here on the screen over this past year is uh, we invested time and expertise, um, lots of expertise from community partners in creating a new vulnerability assessment tool. We've increased our partnerships with housing authorities. We implemented the EHVs, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, we've increased our outreach efforts to include um, a 
broader sector of providers and systems that are interfacing with people experiencing homelessness. We've developed a population specific case, case conferencing meetings like we hold a veterans case conferencing and youth and young adults case conferencing. And that's in order for us to make sure that we are really paying attention to both the needs of that population, but also maybe unique um, opportunities that might be available to them. And most recently, we've increased our funding to meet the needs of survivors of domestic violence. You can take it to the next slide. So we are working to engage uh, victim services providers in the work of coordinated entry in a way that has not been true for us in the past. We will soon begin holding case conferencing meetings specifically for those that are working with those providers in order to maintain the truest forms of confidentiality measures and trainings that these providers might need on conducting assessments. But what we learned last year as we began to engage these partners was a true need for better partnership with housing providers. And so we've set goals for cross-training, housing navigation partnerships, diversion work, and the sharing of best practices from each of these sectors, from the housing sector and from the survivor services sector. Slide, next slide. So this past year, we were awarded additional funding to expand our coordinated entry system in order to better serve survivors of domestic violence, human trafficking, and intimate partner violence. For the past eight months, the COC has been meeting with local um, victim service providers, housing providers, and working in consultation with Safe, uh, Safe Housing Alliance, which is funded by the Western Mass Network to End Homelessness, and we've been planning for this work. So what we're planning to do is to provide housing navigators, um, funding for housing navigators who will be placed within our um, victim service provider agencies. Um, we're also working on that connection uh, between the intersection of homelessness and DV. We're working on an alternative coordinated entry process and model of access for this population because of the needs for conf confidentiality that might be different than a lot of other people that we serve. We're working to improve the core components of our uh, coordinated entry system, specifically in regards to safety and confidentiality and, and autonomy of um, people in this um, population. And then we're working to ensure equitable access for them um, that is you know, the same as any other person who might be experiencing homelessness in our region. And we are working with people with lived experience in order to inform that work. Um, and some of this is just beginning, but we're excited to have the funding for housing navigation, um, specifically to meet the needs of this vulnerable population. And now I am going to introduce Shandal Diaz, who is going to talk with us about those emergency uh, housing vouchers that became part of the COC's work over this past year. Go ahead, Shandal. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. I am a familiar face to many and to some of you I may not be. My name is Shondell Diaz. As Kelly stated, I am the Three County Continuum of Care Coordinated Entry Specialist. And in regards to housing vouchers, emergency housing vouchers, what a great opportunity for our three county area. Um, we've had so much advocacy work done here and a great connection with the housing authorities. Next slide. Now, the scope of the EHVs was that last year we held uh, EHV case conferencing meetings biweekly um, during the initial referring stage. Most referrals came through our coordinated entry system, but also DV providers were able to refer directly to housing authorities. Uh, we prioritize unsheltered individuals and families, long-term shelter stayers, currently homeless families with children under six, people who are disabled, people over the age of 55, people currently experiencing homelessness, overrepresented populations, and those at risk of homelessness. Our COC part, uh, and partners coordinated supported services and helped to connect referrals with appropriate services. Next slide. Originally, or should I say overall, 15 vouchers were awarded to Franklin County Regional Housing Redevelopment Authority. 17 vouchers were awarded to Northampton Housing Authority. And 44 DHCD, which is the Department of Housing and Community Development 
vouchers were awarded, 27 to Berkshire Housing and 17 to Wayfounders. Next slide. And just uh, for a side, a side note, out of those vouchers, unfortunately, 24, not of that total, but 24 separate vouchers have been forfeited, have been forfeited due to various reasons. It could be because they couldn't find housing um, or they found housing through off of one of the other lists and decided that the EHV would not be a good fit for them um, or just some people fell out of contact. Now, what continues and what has changed? So what continues? The COC um, does provide, um, sorry, individuals and families, I was trying to find my face. Individuals and families continue to be referred to the three county coordinated entry system. As they are identified for EHVs, they are placed on a wait list. As vouchers open up, folks on this waste list are then referred to those open EHVs, which are the emergency housing vouchers. Follow-up and referrals and further referrals are discussed in weekly case conferencing. Um, Check-ins are conducted with the RAAs bi-weekly to ensure maximum communication and support for all those who are involved, including RAAs, advocates, and voucher holders. And then just in July of this year, HUD provided DHCD um, with funding on top of what we, uh, the COC, assists in uh, voucher applicants to get uh, service fees, uh, whether it be for first and last. There are so also are some landlord um, incentives in that. But something awesome is the finder's fee program. So basically any advocate that finds and helps a um, EHV holder move into an apartment prior to October 30th will receive a certain um, some a finder's fee and then after that until december from november to december it's a little bit lower but they still get a finder's fee as basically you know great work here you go awesome and then also um have it added to the landlord incentives program um, where they now offer um inspection hqs repair fund for landlords lost rent fund as well as a damages fund next slide some challenges and successes. Um, the challenges have been the lack of affordable housing. Ultimately, that is where it lies, the lack of affordable housing. And some, part, some advocates had said that uh, assisting participants to collect all necessary documentation. Uh, there was a lot of documentation, as you know, um, that it's, it's just been a hassle, birth certificates, um, Social Security cards. It's a long turnaround time to get those things back and to get ahead of anybody is a little bit difficult, but advocates have been working through it and our RAs have been very, very understanding with these requests. Now, but some of the um, successes, right? Outreach. The outreach between advocates and RAAs and anyone assisting in this has been phenomenal. We've connected to so many folks that in the past we might not have been able to connect with new partnerships in the community. Um, seeing the number of lease ups of the vouchers go up and, and the advocates, they are greatest success, right? The advocates are, are who pushed this forward. And I just wanna take a moment to say thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Next vouch, next slide, next voucher. See where my head's at? All right. The three COC, uh, the three county continuum of care, area community partners, youth service providers, and local youth and young adults have made a commitment to identify, address, bring awareness, and end homelessness in Western Mass. Advocates have dedicated time and provided space to meet youth wherever they present and to provide them with the connections to the many resources that there are in our area. Within the last two years, through funding sources such as the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Project, more than 70 youth and young adults have been connected to services through the coordinated entry system with several different resources such as permanent supportive housing, rapid rehousing, transitional housing, and navigation. Through our state resources, with the Executive Office of Health and Human Services, 255 youth have been served in FY22 alone. 
And through youth count efforts, 124 youth responded to the survey preliminarily. The efforts continue through meetings that the COC holds, like the Youth and Young Adult Homelessness Committee and weekly case conferencing. One of our constants in the work we do is the voice of those with lived experience. And in the youth world, this is the Youth Action Board. So I now am going to hand this over to our Youth Action Board representatives, Rhea and Olivia. Hi. I am not sure who's going to be sharing our slides for this. We got you. Oh, thank you. So we are the Youth and Young Adult Action Board. The YAB is a group of youth and young adult activists who are focused on fighting youth and young adult homelessness in Frankshire in Franklin and Hampshire counties, supporting our peers and building community, connecting our peers with local resources. We also increase um, youth and young adult opportunities to engage in legislative advocacy. Um, we've done this in a few different ways. Most recently, um, last week, I had the opportunity, I think it was last week, pretty recently, I went to Capitol Hill Day and I was able to speak with um, some aides from the offices of Jim McGovern, Ed Markey, and Elizabeth Warren. Um, we also highlight and uplift the voices of homeless youth and young adults to facilitate change. Most of our membership is composed of youth and young adults who have experienced homelessness in some capacity. And that's really who we target when we're looking for more membership is really including those voices. We also challenge adultism or the prejudice against youth and young adults within the resources and systems that support youth and young adults. This is an issue that we've kind of noticed is, I guess to put it in plain language, I would say sometimes youth can be underestimated um, or our experience kind of undervalued or overlooked. And we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've been able to do. Um, we created personalized care packages for youth and young adults who've recently aged out of the foster care system because they're more at risk um, for homelessness. But our project actually, um, we kind of made it more broad and opened up the care packages to any youth or young adult who've experienced foster care in any capacity. We also were connecting with local resource providers to create a YAB led space to address issues within our communities and problem solving solutions. We collaborate with the YHDP committee, the Continuum of Care and the Youth Council, which is another group at Community Action Youth Programs. And we recently volunteered with um, Stone Soup Cafe um, and we're hoping to continue that. We're gonna be going back again in October and hopefully um, creating more of like a community service focus to get us all in person again. Um, and then we can go to the next slide. You'll see some pictures of the care packages. We really wanted to give people the option to not just get things they need, but to also get things that would make them really happy and to kind of treat themselves. So you can see, you know, some stuffed animals and journals and blankets, but also, you know, some gift cards and some hygiene products. So we were really proud of this and it was really awesome to see these all come together. All right. Um, also, while we were here, we wanted to talk a little bit about what authentic engagement means to us. Um, as folks who have lived experience with homelessness, um, we just kind of wanted to say what it means to us to have to have authentic engagement beyond just looking for a stamp of approval. Um, asking the people you serve to review things only after they've been created can feel can end up feeling disingenuous and kind of demeaning 
like all that's being asked of is a stamp of approval after things have already been decided instead of um, instead of actually looking for feedback with what's going on, while it's going on. So being proactive and offering us opportunities to be involved in many steps of the process rather than only seeking our voice upon completion can feel a lot more engaging and a lot more like our opinions are being valued. Um, and also work with us to create, to change the way that systems work or open a dialogue about how to challenge existing power structures rather than shutting us down with an idea that request that or a request that conflicts with existing regulations or expectations. Um, there's been a lot of times that we've been like, this would be really cool. And someone has just kind of been like, we can't do that, sorry. And it's hard because like that kind of just ends the conversation rather than trying to figure out a way to still accomplish that goal or a way to still get what we're trying to get done changed. Um, so trying to find a way to make those goals, to meet those goals or find a way around the, th the things that are making that a challenge. And thank you for giving us some space today. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, and I, I think we could all learn uh, uh, a lot about authentic communication. It's something I think we all try to work on uh, so that we're not just going through the motions and really listening to people, but I can see how that would be especially important for the youth population in particular. So I really appreciate that. And also just uh, the work that uh, YAB, or the Youth Action uh, Board uh, does overall, which is really great work. And, and maybe at some point uh, we will actually have uh, a YAB in, in Berkshire County um, uh, or, or one that works with Franklin County to cover Berkshire County. So it's something that we're, we hope to do at some point. So I'd like to uh, now introduce Pamela Schwartz. She is the uh, director of the Western Mass Network and Homelessness and some other vertical programs as well, I think. Uh, and uh, I know she is well known by most of the participants here. Uh, and this is a good opportunity for her to give some updates uh, on what's going on around the network. Great. Thank you, Brad. Good afternoon, everyone. Great to be here. I'm going to be really brief because I know time is uh, ticking away. And I think I, what, I, what I really want to do in my couple of minutes is bring to you what we can do together. Um, we are, as the network, for those who might be new to the network, uh, is, this, is, is a network of all of you, plus many hundreds of others across the four Western counties of Massachusetts. Um, it is, its mission is to prevent and end homelessness with a housing first approach that centers racial equity. We do it through coming together in a lot of different constellations, and we also do it through advocacy. And that's what I wanna focus on right now to bring us all in together on what it is we can do together and how we can be heard. That's what the network offers, a chance to amplify our voices, come together, feel organized, feel our power, and make an impact because we do, we do. When we come together, we make an impact. One of the things that's happening right now, when I'm finished talking after my couple of minutes, I'm gonna put a, a something in the chat that has a series of links. One of them is an organizational sign-on letter that all of you, if you are a part of organizations, can sign that will help us restore access to the RAFT program. The RAFT program, the leading prevention program that keeps people housed. As of August 1st, policy changed so that you need a notice to quit, a filing of a legal document to get access to that resource. That is causing a barrier to access, to barrier to keeping people housed. There's a sign on letter by our state partners leading the charge. We're here to join and amplify Western Massachusetts. Your organization signing on will make a big difference. So that's gonna go in the chat. And it'll also go on the blog, which I'm going to get to in a minute. The other way we can amplify our voices, and Kelly referred to this earlier, thank you very much, is by getting out to vote and understanding what that means, the power that it has, bringing our community into that power, bringing the people we serve into that power. So our job is to uh, feel what it is to connect 
homelessness and housing to what's happening at the ballot box. This November 8th, there are two ballot questions that have a, a direct impact, or I should, I guess it's fair to say indirect, but very meaningful impact on housing and homelessness. That is, and the network has endorsed yes votes on two questions that I want to bring here to you. Question one, the fair share amendment that would raise billions of dollars each year for transportation and public education. Both things have a direct impact on housing stability. And we want to get a yes vote because that will help us preserve people's housing. Um, and, and, and I won't go into the details of how that will happen. Happy, it's a, in short, it's called fair share because it's a millionaire's tax. But that's what's going to be talked about on October 14th. And that link is going to go in the chat. The other question that's going to be talked about is question four, preserving the law that was just passed in this last legislative session uh, to allow uh, any a, a qualified drivers to obtain a, a license, regardless of their immigration status. There's an effort to repeal that law. And, um, and that will have also an impact on housing stability. If people cannot get to work, cannot get to childcare, cannot get to doctor's appointments. So these questions and the whole ballot and, and what it means to register to vote will be on the ballot as, uh, I mean, will be talked about on October 14th um, at 10 a.m. I'm gonna put that link. Lastly, I wanna say, join the network blog. That's our way to stay connected. It's our way for us to get news about what's happening. I'm going to put that link in there. We've got over 700 subscribers. Let's make it 750 by the end of today. Um, and stay tuned for these links. Let's stay connected. We can make a difference together. And I'm so happy and look forward to continuing the work. Thanks so much. I always feel like I need to start cheering after Pamela has spoken because your energy is so important. Um, so. I wanted to move us along and say that we are really excited that this past year we were able to partner, um, Michelle, you can put slides up too whenever you're ready, um, this year with Dr. Bossi and the Board of Independent Housing Solutions to fund the housing and the supportive services and the new building at Five Franklin in Northampton. This project was an innovative brainchild of Dr. Bossi, who has been working to serve this population as one of the only medical providers in the region supporting our houseless neighbors. I'd like to introduce Dr. Bossi and to uh, allow her to talk more about what this project is designed to do and where we are at with the start of it. Hi guys. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jess Bossi. I'm one of the, I'm the I've been the only full-time medicine provider for the houseless community in Western Mass for the last uh, five and a half years. Um, during my role in this position, um, it became very clear that we needed, number one, just more housing, I think, which everyone has echoed here, as well as different types of housing um, that serves uh, a larger array of individuals, not just assisted living, uh, which is not affordable for the vast majority of the population, as well as just independent living, which isn't appropriate. So um, I came together with a bunch of wonderful uh, direct service partners, such as uh, Mana Community Kitchen and the Friends of the Hampshire County Homeless Individual, uh, the Survival Center in Northampton, the city of Northampton itself, um, and of course the COC, uh, Community Action of Pioneer Valley, to uh, build a 16-unit complex for um, our very chronic homeless individuals who have not been able to find housing because appropriate housing for them doesn't exist. Um, they would typically need something like an assisted living facility, but that costs um, exorbitant amounts of money, upwards of like $5,000 a month. So our, our folks that are struggling with poverty can't um, afford that. So this uh, housing complex is located very close to downtown in Northampton, Massachusetts, uh, 5 Franklin Street. Um, it is a shared building, but it has a lot of, um, so there's single room occupancies, uh, but they're quite large rooms and they're built to accommodate a wide variety of needs. So individuals that are in wheelchairs, mechanical wheelchairs, um, people that have complex medical issues, 
there um, is a main floor with a large living room and entertainment space, dining um, area, shared kitchen. There's a space for a case manager. And then there's um, also a, a medical um, office. So this is an example of some of the rooms. The um, room on the lower portion of the screen um, is extra large and it has um, washing facilities like a bathroom and um, like a shower head that can accommodate someone who has a lot of difficulty with um, toileting or showering. It has room for a hospital bed. Um, and we're very excited that this uh, partnership with um, MANA and the Hampshire County uh, Friends of the Homeless, uh, we were able to provide furniture for the entire building and there'll be hot meal delivery every day. The survival center will provide food for the uh, shared kitchen. So this is a very supported space and there will be staff on site, um, like visiting nurses and a bunch of healthcare professionals during the day. And then a case, um, like a program manager from 3 p.m. to 11 p.m. to help support the, the residents in this building. And we're opening very soon. <laughs> By November 1st, people will be in their rooms. So the finishing touches just need to go on. Thanks so much. So I think I'm going to have the privilege of actually uh, introducing uh, the Bracewell Project and Kathy Keezer. And I'd just like to provide a little background information uh, on uh, the Bracewell project. Uh, during this year's CRC competition, we were excited to apply for funding to support a new program in Berkshire County. Uh, this program will provide housing and services for youth and young adults experiencing homelessness, which is a critical need here in our region. This past year, we were able to contribute 500,000 of state capital funding through the Executive Office of Health and Human Services uh, uh, through a regional contract with the COC, uh, which is going to uh, support unaccompanied youth programming in the three county area. These funds uh, will be utilized for renovation of, of the Bracewell building in the city of North Adams. Our hope is that the COC will be able to be awarded operations and supported services funding for FY22 to further support this initiative. The Lewis and House uh, is and has been for a long time a key partner in uh, the work to end homelessness in the Berkshire County region. Uh, and Kathy Keezer, their executive director, uh, is here to share more about uh, the, uh, the plans uh, for this exciting uh, development uh, and a, a really important resource for our community. And I just also just want to give a shout out to Kathy because she is often willing to take on these uh, very difficult projects uh, that uh, based on their scale are sometimes even more difficult to make uh, uh, work for our community. So, so thanks, Kathy. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm glad to be here. And I think the key thing I just want to say at first, this is just another example of collaboration and partnership. This never would have come about um, if things hadn't just come at the right time and been at the right meeting and listening up and just collaboration. So it's really important and the COC was at the prime center of that with us. Of course, we're part of the COC. So the COC is the lead and also the COC is all of us. Um, we had a building that was given to us a few years previously by the housing authority. Now it was not a program that would make that any concern for ownership. It was through a nonprofit that they had they'd organized and were dissolving. So it was a dissolved nonprofit had given us to us. We'd used it for a little while for premise supportive housing originally, but it's it was in shape, bad shape. It needed to be redone. And we were like, what do we do with this building now? Do we get rid of it? Do we sell it? You know, what do we do? So the timing was perfect sitting at a collaboration when we're talking about youth services. And it's also something that we've been working on with everybody in Berkshire County about youth housing. Um, we see so many, so does Berkshire County Regional, so do we, all you guys across the region of youth in homelessness. And that's been a concern because just sticking them in, so to speak, with other adults is not always the best. So we've always been talking in North Berkshire about wouldn't it be great to have youth housing. So that was the piece that came along 
And out of that collaboration, I have to give a heads up to Phil Ringwood from Dial Self for stepping forward and really helping kind of kick this off for us and get it going. Um, we got our architect from a previous project to work really with Phil and we talked with the OHS and got some ideas about what are the needs and what's worked in the youth housing field. And again, talking about single room occupancies, you know, their starting kind of framework of housing, you know, having a smaller room, kind of like just they were talking about before. Um, what we're looking at is on the first floor, the model would be having three single room occupancies that are enhanced so they would have their own kitchen their own um you know bathroom it would be a small space kind of like a motel room uh, but it would be their own space there'd be laundry shared second floor oh there'd be an accessible apartment if it's needed on the first floor which is key too second floor would have three again single room two i'm sorry two single room occupancies with small kitchen that bathroom and the whole idea is these could also be shorter term housing options if it was needed as time goes along. That was one of our thoughts. Um, and then we would also have one two bedroom apartment for either pregnant or parenting youth or use, plural. Um, those are such a need and we've had so many of youth in need and youth homeless this year that it's been really tough. But again, Phil, and Dial South and EOHS and, and the um, COC in general helped us to kind of kick into everything. Um, right now where we're at is we've got a, we've got a um, development consultant helping us. We've got at least our tentative um, builder in mind. It's a woman owned business locally. Obviously as things move along, we'll see how all that works out. Um, but we are in, process of applying for the funding, the rest of the funding needed to do this building. So for the rest of the project, we're looking at MASH funding, some of the ARPA funding coming down from the state level. We've applied and been accepted for the last stages. We don't know if we'll be in the final phase for MASH. We also applied through traditional ARPA funds with DHCD um, for either ARPA or other funds. And we don't have to put that in until we'll know if if MASH is needed. So we either put the other three quarters of the money needed from that or it'll be a mixture of funding sources. But we believe that one way or the other we'll have the funding sources to fix this building to get it done. Um, we already we've already done the environmental phase and we own it free and clear. So that makes it easy. There's no leadership. There's no environmental issues. Um, there were no it was lead free. And as best we know, but we're going to find some lead and some asbestos in an old building in North Adams. You know, it's going to be some in the thing, but essentially it's going to be straightforward, pretty much tear out the interior and rebuild it is basically what's going to happen. And hopefully a little better enhanced um, utilities so that we save in costs later down the line. Um, and then it's already been mentioned the idea of how do we how do we support the services to come in there work with that besides continuing with EOHHS for youth emergency funding also to have supportive services through the COC would really be key this would avoid this would make departments affordable it would cover most of the costs of the building and we wouldn't have to go through then trying to get MRVP vouchers and things. So that would really make it much easier to house youth, support it, and make the project succeed. So again, I just want to thank everybody for coming and being partner with us in it. Um, it will give a use to the building. It will make a difference in North Adams and North Berkshire and Berkshire County for youth housing, and it's really appreciated. Thanks, Kathy. Hi, folks. So as you see on the screen, um, this is a part of our three county racial, racial equity action plan that we worked for the last two years, or actually I think it's pushing three almost, um, with area partners and um, our um, 
racial equity partners, and um, again, priorities and goals that are on our racial equity action plan. Um, next slide, I would like to introduce uh, Lisa Cerebella, um, one of our partners with lived experience um, who works very closely with us. Lisa? <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Very happy to be here. Some of the things that we are working on, and here are the racial equity focal points as outlined in the previous slide, that the COC is working on now, and I will just name a few. In coordinated entry, we are working to respond to a recent evaluation of our coordinated entry system through a racial equity lens, increasing language access and identifying accessibility needs. For the data goal, we will be examining whether the new vulnerability assessment tool will make a difference in addressing racial inequities we have seen in access to housing for various populations. The coordinated entry work group is tasked with identifying strategies to reduce high acuity and high acuity disparities, stratifying performance measures and annual racial disparities report across all household types and project types to identify racial disparities, which basically means that we'll look at performance measures, exits to housing, increases in income, et cetera, by race, ethnicity, and primary language to see if there are racial or ethnic disparities within different project types or households. In the organizational training and development, we will work to be sure the recently implemented COC-wide anti-discrimination and equal access policy is being followed on the funded program level and providing needed trainings, as mentioned earlier. For the housing continuum goal, there are regional efforts in housing development and shelter capacity. Lived experience, we are focused on the creation of a lived experience advisory group facilitated by partners with lived experience. Legislative policy, there are many state level efforts that advocate for policy change that would increase equity measures, which panelists Schwartz from the Western Mass Network to End Homelessness spoke about earlier. We look forward to the Western Mass Network racial equity work group to understand. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, next, we are going to be taking a quick look at data around homelessness in Hampshire, Berkshire, and Franklin counties. So first, we're starting by looking at a chart that looks at the percentage of people who have entered permanent housing after leaving either an emergency shelter, transitional housing, or rapid rehousing program from 2019 on the left up through 2020 on the right. Um, as we can see in this current year, um, so far 36% of people who have left one of these programs have entered permanent housing. That was their exit destination when they left the program. Um, and we can see this steady increase since 2019. This increase in the proportion of people being housed over the past few years um, is really in large part thanks to the work of a lot of the um, shelter and housing providers in the region, ServiceNet, Craig Stores, Lewis and Health, Elliott Human Services and many of the youth and veteran service providers. Um, since October 1st of 2021 up through today, essentially, there have been 136 people who have entered permanent housing after leaving a shelter. So what this 36% is representative of. Um, in this next graph, we're looking at the same 2019 through 2022 timeframe and data, but here we're looking with a race and ethnicity lens. Um, so, Looking at this chart, we can see there have been improvements in some areas um, and some losses in others. Percentage of all individuals who exit to permanent housing has increased a little bit, although Hispanic or Latino or Latino individuals um, have a lower rate of exits to permanent housing in 2021 and 2022 than they did in 2019 and 2020. That's we've seen a decrease there. Um, and what we really want to see here, of course, is higher percentages where people are exiting to permanent housing um, more often when they leave a program. Um, they also have a lower rate currently than um, Hispanic, I'm sorry, than Black or African American or Af African individuals of any ethnicity and the blue line are white, non-Hispanic, non-Latino, non-Latino individuals in the yellow line. We're both at about 40% this year. Next, we're looking at the average duration of homelessness. So we're looking at for people um, before someone enters permanent housing, how long is someone spending in homelessness? Again, we're looking at 2019 through 2022, um, looking at race and ethnicity. And we can see um, people 
have been experiencing longer lengths of time in homelessness um, in recent years. And in past years, this length has been increasing overall, um, but it's been increasing at different um, rates for different populations based on race and ethnicity. Um, for example, Hispanic, Latino, Latina individuals, um, this has been an especially sharp increase where in 2022, we saw an average of 10.2 months experiencing homelessness, um, increased from 5.8 months in 2021, and only 4.9 months in 2019. Um, and as we've talked about um, a few times over uh, the course of this meeting, we know that there is um, a need for more affordable and available housing. And that's part of the reason that it is taking a long time to enter housing or increasing lengths of time to enter housing. This is something that we're seeing um, both across the state and across the country are longer lengths of stay in homelessness. Next, we have here a screenshot from literally this is from HUD COC racial equity analysis tool. Um, I'll post a link to that tool in the chat afterwards. Anyone can access the tool and see racial um, and ethnic disparity breakdowns for any COC across the country. Um, and this is looking at American Community Survey data from 2015 to 2019 compared to the 2022 point in time count, um, which is again a count of everyone experiencing homelessness on a single night in the winter. It was February 23rd this past year. So this particular chart is looking at ethnicity and we felt that it was really important to highlight this chart because we can see a very drastic overrepresentation um, of Hispanic or Latino, Latino individuals experiencing homelessness that a quarter of everyone in the point in time count identified as Hispanic or Latino um, compared to 5% of the general population. That's a really significant overrepresentation. Um, and it's even more drastic when we look at just families. Over half of all families in the three county COC who are experiencing homelessness on the on night of the point in time count um, identify as Hispanic or Latino. So again, that's compared to 5% of the total population. Um, Yes, so it's very, very drastic here. Um, next, we also want to show this local um, data that we put together. And this is based on the 2020 census, so it's a little more recent for the general population. Um, and here, instead of the point in time count data, we're looking at HMIS data um, in our database. When we look at the racial breakdown of everyone in the three county area on the top compared with everyone in shelter or emergency housing over the past year, which is this middle line experience of homelessness, um, and everyone exiting shelter to permanent housing in this bottom row, we still see significant disparities in who is experiencing homelessness. Um, white persons of any ethnicity make up about 85% of the general population, but just about 80% of everyone experiencing homelessness. Uh, we see significant overrepresentations of um, Black, Latino, and Native American um, and Indigenous individuals, as well as multiracial individuals compared to the general population. Um, but we also know there are some societal reasons behind this. Um, we heard from Kumar earlier and had discussions around um, things like redlining, discriminatory lending, um, other components like hiring practices, over incarceration, institutional racism contributes to less generational wealth, um, we're creating additional barriers in finding and maintaining housing. When we do compare those experiencing homelessness to who is exiting homelessness um, programs or situations to permanent housing, we see that, for example, American Indian or um, indigenous individuals make up 1.7% of the population experiencing homelessness, only 0.1% of the general population, and only 0.6% of the population exiting to housing. So what we hope to see is that the rates of who is exiting housing match the rates of who is entering homelessness or who is in homelessness. But we don't see that. We see um, disparities in who enters housing compared to who is experiencing homelessness. Um, okay. So one of the things that we are trying to do to address this is looking into system modeling. Um, HUD has recently released this new system modeling tool to help communities determine the best strategies for improving service outcomes and best resources to prioritize with new funds. Um, it's called Stella Modeling or Stella M. Um, this is based off a test that we did. And essentially we enter known information about our community, about what types of housing have different um, success rates in terms of average days someone experiences homelessness if they're in that program. 
um, the percent of people who are exiting to permanent housing or percent, percentage of people who are returning to homelessness after exiting to permanent housing for that program. And then it recommends what it thinks would be the best resources um, for the community to fund in order to improve our services, in order to reduce the length of time people are spending in homelessness, reduce the um, rate at which people are returning to homelessness. So this is just an example, and its uh, recommendation was already 200 additional shelter beds, an additional to 25 to 30 rapid rehousing units. Um, and we are presenting this because it's really supposed to be a community-driven process. Um, and we are hoping to actually begin this process in 2023. We'd like to convene a group to begin utilizing this tool for real and setting goals that are important to the community um, to inform our work. So please be on the lookout um, for some communication around Stella modeling or system modeling this next year to help us plan to use this tool and begin some um, informed system planning for our future resources. And I think that's about it. Next, um, I'd like to invite Brad up again to, I think, talk about the membership votes, board and membership votes. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so uh, we- Brad? Yes. Sorry, it's Betsy interrupting. I was just wondering if I can ask a quick question of Michelle or if there's no time. I know we're tight on time, but I also- Okay. But, but no, I, I think, yeah, go ahead. We'll. If it's All a right. good question, then we'll try right. to Yeah, it. Michelle, I was just wondering if you go back to the slide, I was I was struggling trying to figure out how to read it. Maybe you, maybe you told us how to read it, but there are two blocks for each color and each color represents either emergency services, transitional, rapid rehousing, and per what are the, I didn't hear yes. what you said what the two columns are. I'm sorry, I, I did blow through this slide a little bit. Um, the, the first column in each is our current inventory for that type of resource oh. for emergency shelter, transitional okay. housing. And the second column is the recommendation that the tool is saying would give us these um, performance outcomes in 2025, would result in 263 days average homelessness, 4.9% returns if we move to the second column of its proposed um, allocations for different bed inventories. Thanks. Okay, so I am, I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna try to make this as quick as possible. And I guess the best way to do that would be to have uh, most likely Kelly uh, on the first one, give a quick update on uh, the governance uh, charter updates, which are, are relatively small. Um, you wanna go to the next slide, Michelle? Thanks. So uh, those of you who registered for this meeting were sent these documents out ahead of time. So we will be as brief as we possibly can um, and just say that there was a very small change um, to the uh, governance charter this, this time around. And it just actually was expanding the suggested areas to pull for the board recruitment. Um, as we talked about earlier, we really want to do some diversification. Um, and that includes, you know, the voices at the largest table for the COC, which is the board of directors, um, then the table that makes the big, the biggest amount of decisions. Um, and so this is just um, increasing the language um, to make sure that we're pulling from um, lots of populations. Um, and those populations that are close to what we serve. Um, and then the second um, change is just to actually include a permanent seat for a local shelter provider. We've had uh, ServiceNet sitting on our board for quite some time because they were a funded agency um, in the COC, but we also wanted to make sure that we um, have a local shelter provider seat on the board. So those are the changes, if you wanna. Yeah, so, I would, so I would entertain a motion uh, that we accept uh, those changes as proposed. Um, I'll make that move. motion. Okay. Second. And, okay. I'm going to assume there's no discussion. So all those in favor, hand signal or something. Uh, great. And uh, if anyone's opposed, uh, please let us know. Okay. I'm making the assumption we're, we've got unanimous uh, support for that. Um, now we have the uh, HMIS uh, changes, which really have to do with a new system. My guess is Michelle will be telling us a, a, a quick or giving us a quick summary. 
sector, um, there were very minimal changes to the HMIS charter this year. Um, they were primarily just to reflect that we've changed our HMIS vendor um, and software from Social Solutions ETO to BitFocus's Clarity HMIS. Um, we removed some of our um, pieces around the data warehouse and brought in the state's new rehousing data collective. Um, and we just changed our language around our new release of information. Thank you so much. I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to entertain a motion that we accept uh, the changes as uh, proposed. So moved. Thank you. I'm going to, do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, uh, I'm going to put it up for a vote. All those in favor? Anyone opposed? It appears to have passed unanimously. Great. So, so next is just the board list. Um, and so, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm. Um, everyone received this in advance as well, I believe. Um, There's some new appointees and some uh, folks that were reappointed in an uh, you know, effort to save time. Um, I think we could just take a quick look at this rather than reading them off. And then I would entertain a motion that we accept uh, the proposed list of membership uh, as, as uh, written in this document. So moved. Do Sorry, I have... who, who was that? Sorry. That was Zemi Kelly. Bill, okay, thanks. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Thanks, Steve. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any, any opposed? Okay. Passes unanimously. Great. Great. Congrats to our new board members. Yes, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm, I know we're short on time and I'm supposed to close this out here. I'll keep this really short then. Um, uh, because I got, this was an assi a late assignment to me anyway. So you got to get off the hook a little bit, but Next in any event, so <laughs> it's, uh, in the Jewish faith, uh, we are in what are called the 10 days of awe. And that's between Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish new year and, uh, Yom Kippur, which is the called day of atonement. And, um, and these days have been characterized in, in, uh, many different ways. Uh, including, uh, you know, an opportunity to repent. I don't really view them that way. I view them more as an opportunity to reflect. Uh, and I think that it, it's uh, great that we're having this annual meeting right around the highest of holidays, because that's how I view this meeting, actually. I view this meeting, this annual meeting, not just as something that we do uh, in a, a perfunctory manner, but rather something that we do so that we can reflect on all the good work we're doing, but also reflect on what we can do better, how we can be better, how we can tackle the issues that we've heard about today in a more effective manner. And I think this gives us the launching pad, the foundation uh, to kick off our year and really tackle those issues, very much like the high holidays do in the Jewish faith. So that's all I'll leave it for us uh, today. Thank you so much, Brad. And the last thing that I'm just gonna say is right after this meeting, I am pressing submit for the COC's application that has taken us the last two months um, as a community to, to uh, work towards uh, being able to submit. And so I'm very excited to share that with all of you the day of our annual meeting. Have a wonderful afternoon and the rest of your day. We're so thankful for all of you that get to join us um, on a regular basis to do this work. Uh, we feel very partnered in all of that effort. So thank you all. Have a great day.